for three years. Their soul was stolen. Their body was murdered. They disassociated from their emotions. They became emotionally crippled. In the deepest core, they feel that they are worthless and valueless. They want to die rather than live. Can nobody realize that this is a revolt against toxicity and poison that has infiltrated the Jewish community in a very deep way, and that those who speak are condemned, and that perpetrators have become victims, and victims have become perpetrators because they speak up? Can't we realize that these children are unconsciously or consciously protesting like Elio Anavi in his day against Achav and his wife Izevel, who murdered Nevois and then stole his vineyard and then Elio said Haratzachta, the Gamdarashta. You murder Nevois the Israeli and then you inherit his field. This child got murdered and now the Gamdarashta. And now we condemn him for embarrassing his family. I love it. A child was murdered emotionally, and now he or she is condemned for protesting it. They are condemned for doing things that for them is the only way they know how to survive under these unbearable conditions. The Yeshiva.net. Ruchim Abayim, welcome everybody. Thank you for gracing us with your presence. I see there is a miracle in the making. I've been to Kesher Nafshi for quite a few years now, and I believe this is the first time in history that a speech is starting almost on time. You'd, all, you'd almost think that this event was organized by a Yeke and a Litvak put together. It's not, so this is the miracle. Wow. Reb Gedalia, he told me 5.30 exactly. 5.30 exactly, one Mitzray Shabbos meant three hours later. But today, 13 minutes later. Nishka Ferlich. Wonderful. The good thing about this speech is that it has a beginning and it also has an end time. Because we have to welcome Shabbos. So with this particular speaker, that's a very big mile, I'm just telling you. I have a wonderful crowd. I have a wonderful crowd, and now I have you too. Thank you, thank you. Tell my mother-in-law. All compliments to my mother-in-law, please. <laughs> so this week, the entire world was gripped by the news of four young children who survived a harrowing experience in a jungle for 40 days. In the Parsha, when we read about spies not surviving and losing their optimism and faith over 40 days, it was a fascinating contrast to read the story of these little kids, a 13-year-old, a 9-year-old, a 4-year-old, and an 11-month-old baby in the Amazon Colombian jungle for 40 days, May 1 till June 9th. I want to tell you this story if you haven't read it, because I feel the Baal Shem Tev used to say that everything a person sees or hears can transform a life. Everything is a lesson. And as I was reading the story this morning, I was moved by such profound lessons for our lives, for our children's lives, for our lives as parents, as friends, as spouses, as pedagogues, as human beings, and as Jews. So the story begins May 1st, early morning. There's a family, a mother and four children, together with another few, four adults, another two adults, who are flying. The plane crashes. It takes 16 days for rescuers to find the wreckage of the plane 
and they find three adults dead, the mother and the two other adults, but four children are gone. They could see the imprint of footsteps, of baby footsteps. They see a baby bottle. They see some other remnants of babies, so they know that there are children, but they're not to be found. Naturally, they would assume if three adults were killed, certainly the children were killed, but there was no evidence for that. So they begin to search for these four children. It takes them 40 days to find them. They found them last Friday, last Arab Shabbos, June 9th. Thin, hungry, but alive, very much alive. They couldn't land helicopters in the jungle because there's no place to land. So they had to airlift child by child and transport them to a hospital where they are still today, recovering from the experience. As the oldest girl, 13 years old, her name is Leslie, shared on a video, her mother lived four days after the crash. Wounded right near the plane, her mother was alive and they wanted to stay with the mother. The mother who realized she won't be able to survive if nobody finds her, instructed her children to leave her, to go find refuge for themselves, because if they remain there, they too will die. They listened to their mother and they left. Four days later, she passed away and these four kids had to fend for themselves. Leslie is 13. Then you have Solini is nine. You have T and four and you have Christine, 11 months, who was obviously nursing and had to be carried by oldest sister, by Leslie, who's 13 years old. They were asking the children how they survived, what they did. They had a little farina, a little kasha on the airplane. They had some fruits, but that was finished fast. But knowing the forest, knowing the jungle, they lived off seeds for 40 days and some fruits that were growing. Luckily, this time of the year, June is the time of harvest. Hayomim yemei bikure anovim. So they lived. She took a flashlight. She took hiking gear. She took protective gear. This is a jungle where it rains 16 hours a day. It's a real jungle. Adults would have a hard time surviving. Westerners, <laughs> if the sushi doesn't come on time, we know what Gedalia has to deal with. If the tea room doesn't have almond milk. It doesn't, by the way. It doesn't. I'm already miserable. After Tayamea, there's no almond milk in the tea room. We know the emotional crisis. That's why we have Rip Shimon Russell here. And some, others, some other highly trained therapists. So imagine a 13, 9, 4, and 11 month old baby surviving these 40 days. They stayed near waters. So they would always have access to water. They protected each other. They knew how to create makeshift tents to survive danger, harm, and rain. They knew how to eat in a way that they would be able to nourish their emaciated bodies that didn't have any real nourishing food. And they knew how to support each other psychologically, emotionally, and of course, physically, practically. Planes flew by and threw down packages of food. They had loudspeakers with a voice note from their grandmother speaking to the children in the jungle and saying, just stay together, you're going to be fine, you're gonna get out of this. They came twice to places very close to them, but they couldn't find them. This is a jungle that is so filled with growth of all types and the darkness and the density of it simply makes it impossible to land anything and to find people. And yet, after 40 days, around three miles, away from where the crash happened, the four children were Baruch Hashem found and found alive. Now, 
Another miracle that happened was the villagers who live in the area, they are the experts, but they simply didn't have the technology or the ability to achieve such a feat. So the army joined them. For these two groups to join together in Colombia is quite miraculous in its own right. But that joint effort of this team allowed them, and you had hundreds and hundreds of volunteers from the army and from the villagers and the foragers trying to rescue these children. Between dogs, 150 soldiers, and many hikers and villagers and foragers, they ended up finding these poor children. I was thinking about this story, and I thought to myself, wow, there's a very, very deep lesson here. And I was asking, what did it take for these kids to survive? And I realized it was three things, or so the experts were explaining. The first thing is, their mother empowered them and believed that they could make it. Their mother told them, I won't make it, but if you kids take care of each other and you go do what you have to do, you will survive. They had faith that they'll be able to endure these horrific circumstances. They believed that they can do it. They knew it would be hard, but they had a certain conviction, what we would call an amuna. They had a very deep-seated, profound, ingrained notion that, yes, we will get through this. They did not leave their mother in this endless despair. We're just doomed to die. They believed if they work hard, they're going to make it. That was number one. But that wasn't enough. The second thing is, because they lived not far, they knew the forest. They understood the terrain. They knew what jungle life is like. They knew what is destructive and what is constructive. They knew what you can eat and what may be poisonous and venomous and you can't eat. They knew which seeds will be absorbed in a body and other plants that may harm a body. They also had immunity from years in the around it. They had immunity to many of the hazards that are prevalent in these jungles. But their firsthand knowledge to the lore of the forests, to the stories, to the experiences, to the climate, to the environment, to the structure, to the terrain, gave them an opportunity to be able to navigate this almost impossible feat, never mind with a third, with a nine, with an 11 month old baby who was just abrupted and her nursing was just interrupted so brutally and so sadly when they had to literally carry during their journeys in this jungle. But that also wasn't enough. The third component was they had support. If these siblings were on their own, I don't know what would have happened. They supported each other. The 13-year-old was only 13, but she could support the 9-year-old, the 4-year-old, and of course, the 11-month-old. The fact that they were a team, they were family, and they knew they were family. And everyone knew that without the other, there was no way they could survive this darkness, this horror. That allowed them to make it through, and last week, they were all saved. You know where I'm getting at? Can I just stop talking, and let's call it a day, and we can go prepare for Shabbos, or I have to finish. The men also know where I'm going? Or like, why is he talking about the Amazon? <laughs> It's an incredible story, but I think it's also our story. Your story, my story, our story, and I think it's the story of Kesher Nafshi. And I think in many ways it's the story of the Jewish people. Nobody's here because they didn't have anywhere to go for Shabbos. Right? I'm not sure anyone is sitting in this room and came to the rally. You know what? I heard there's going to be some interesting people in the rally. From the entire Jewish world, my nachas from one to ten is a hundred. We're the family that's called the perfect family. The shatchanam are knocking on the door 24 hours a day because they heard that our family is krem, dala krem, dala krem, dala krem. Such a family never existed 
in the history of the Jewish people, father perfect, mother perfect. Everyone is valedictorian, Beis Yaakov, Beis Rachel, Bruyer, Shalamist, Neve, Brisk, uh, Shabin, uh, Mir, whatever, everybody. The boys, the girls, we're like top, top, top. But we want to go for a Shabbos to the Catskills. There's a journey, and everybody is on a journey. And it's a journey which sometimes feels like, and may indeed be a journey through a jungle, and through a dangerous jungle, and through a chaotic jungle. There's a lot of pain, a lot of darkness, and a lot of confusion, and a lot of despair. Some of you have even seen the wreckage of crashes. You've seen death or something that's close to death, or spiritual death, or emotional death, or even physical death. These little kinderlach survived, and they did it three ways. The first one is they didn't doubt that they can get through it. There's a great, great line in English. It comes from somebody who I don't, I don't like to quote. His name is Henry Ford. And he said, whether you believe you can or you believe you can't, you're probably right. If you believe you can't, you're right. And if you believe you can, you're also right. It's how some of Farsham explain why the spies indeed and the generation of the spies could not go into the Holy Land. Because if you believe you can't, it will become a self-fulfilling prophecy. If I really believe I can't, then I really can't. I don't have that ability. What these kids had, what their mother gave them was that conviction that despite her own journey, sad journey and end, they will be able to live. They will be able to emerge, maybe scathed, but whole, alive, vibrant. What our children need more than anything else are such mothers and such fathers who believe in them when maybe so many others stop believing in them, who believe in them when they may not believe in themselves, who believe in them when they may be rattled with so much pain that they can't even articulate how much pain they're dealing with. Because the pain of so many of these children is a pain that is so profound that they have no words for them. And their parents, unless parents who are highly sensitive and worked out people and really know the workings of trauma on an unconscious level, often don't see. Let's face it, when your parents, uncles, aunts, brothers-in-law, sisters-in-law, Zaydas, Babas, Shvers, Shvigas, I'm talking about the clueless ones. When they come to visit, what do they tell you about your family? They're fine. They're just spoiled. You ever heard that brilliance? They're just spoiled. And you know why they're spoiled? Because you don't know how gvura works. Chesed, 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 chesed. Who's brainwashing you? Who brainwashed you? Keshe Let's sue them. <laughs> See how much money Gedalia has. <clears throat> At the surface, kids may be smiling. They may be having so much fun on the tablet or on the phone or whatever they're using. It takes a lot of sensitivity and a lot of acute awareness to be able to see what's happening beneath the layers. I received an email from a woman the other day, literally two weeks ago, and she heard something I said. And she described to me her daughter, her daughter is 17 years old, and she writes these words. My daughter grew up in my home and she had the best midas in my entire family. Sterling character. The most refined emotions you can find in a human being. But she turned 17 and she became so cruel, obnoxious, rude. She's destroying me, her father, and all of the children. I want to throw her out of the house. Watching. What a horrible human being she became. Do you agree? So I wrote back to her. And I said, I'm not sure you should be doing that. Could be that this girl needs to be understood. What has happened to her? So she wrote, writes to me, here you go again with the liberal progressive stupidity and folly that the new generation of indoctrinated Rabbis and teachers have been brainwashed by secular media and culture. 
Not to discipline children. It's not verbatim, but it's close. I have a better vocabulary than her. But it's close. <laughs> Just telling you how I processed it, right? <laughs> have been brainwashed to believe in all this nonsense rather than putting your foot down and telling them the way it is, just like our parents did to us. That's always a key word. You know how you have key words? Just like our parents did to us. Which means I'm thinking, of course, <laughs> of course. <laughs> Don't you realize how you are a living embodiment of what your parents did to you? And it's exactly what you want your daughter to become an extension of 2,000 years of unresolved trauma in the glorious tradition of epigenetics. It's your way of coping. I can't even blame you. So after she gave me this whole Mishaberach, it was a very beautiful Mishaberach she gave me because it also had a, an amazing compliment. And the compliment was that many of the indoctrinated rabbis have a mentor who brainwashed them. And there's a few of the mentors responsible for this brainwashing. Yours truly was one of them. So when I read this Misha Beirach, I wrote back. And I said, I understand the pain and I'm sorry, I get it. But I just want to ask you a question. You say that she had the most sterling character. She had the most beautiful sensitivity and emotional connection in the world. So just explain to me, at 17, did the soul of the Gestapo enter into her consciousness, some Dibuk, some Gilgal, some Ibor that Darizal talks about, the soul of a Nazi went into her. She woke up one morning and said, you know what? I'm going to turn this home into a concentration camp. I'm going to torture my mother and father, make them miserable until the last breath. And this will be the victory of Hitler against my family, those he didn't manage to kill out 80 years ago, I will manage to finish them off one by one through endless depression and despair. Is this really what happened to your daughter? I doubt it. Maybe something else happened. Why don't you investigate? And even if you don't find out, why don't you pause and ask yourself what she needs and maybe speak to some people who have experience in this field. So she writes back to me, and she says, how do you know? How do you know? Maybe, yes, maybe one day the Sahara took her over, and she turned from a beautiful girl into an evil human being, and she wants to destroy our home, and why should I let her do that? At this point, I picked up my eyes and I said, are there jobs available in the bagel shop? Who makes such people? You. <laughs> so why don't you send her an email? I didn't make her. I'm not responsible for this brain. I didn't traumatize this mother. I don't know who she is. And I can hear a subtle, I don't want to be, sound like a hallucinating mishugana. But sometimes when I ask Hashem that, he gives one of two answers. One is... You do your thing and I'll work through you. And then it's amazing. And sometimes he says, I'm busy. <laughs> and usually the email is a disaster. <laughs> I wrote back to her and I said, listen, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you're right. Maybe, yes. You're maybe. <laughs> I've been humbled enough by life to know that I can be wrong. However, let me just tell you something. If you are going to err, I know which side you probably want to err on. You can assume that I am wrong, you are right. She is the Russia of the generation. She is the quintessential machshefa. And we know what the Torah says about a machshefa. You can assume that. Maybe you're right. But one day you may find out that you erred. One day you may find out that she's actually not wicked. She's broken. And she may have been broken in ways you never even imagined. It may be by a brother, a sister, 
It could be by a family member who's supposed to protect a child. I didn't want to get specific because I don't know. But you may find out these things. And you will never forgive yourself till your last breath for destroying this girl who was completely innocent and her soul was murdered. Or you may listen to what I'm saying. And I may be wrong. And you may err. And the worst thing that will happen one day is you will find out that you smiled too much to a machshefa. <laughs> that you were kind to a girl who didn't deserve it. That you were generous and nice and loving and embracing to a young woman who was really obnoxious in etzem hanefesh because somehow the evil dibuk of the Nachash HaKadmoyni went into her psyche right in your home at the age of 17, Begematria Toiv. And then you will have to say a shamnu for being nice to a daughter who did not deserve it. My advice to you is, if you got to err, probably you want to err to this side rather than to this. But nothing, I got no answer after that. Let's hope she's thinking about it. So I hope. Nothing, nothing can substitute the faith and conviction of a mother and a father in a child that you will be able to endure this jungle. We can send our children to the best therapists and we should try if we can. We should and get every support we can. But let's face it, no therapist in the world, as great and holy as they are, can do what mommy and tati can do. Nobody. Because of the natural organic bond the Rebbeinu Shalom created, because of the familiarity, and because of the wounds. Hapesha osahu hapesha hitir, keboi kach poltai. In halacha we know the way the forbidden flavor is absorbed, that's how it gets emitted. Usually the flavor of trauma is absorbed in and through family. So there's nobody like family to be able to expel it, to be able to heal those very same wounds. Hapesha osar, hu hapesha itir. I want to translate osar as in, the Gemara in Sanhedrin uses osar as in putting bandages around a wound, and hitir is untying those bandages. The one who wounded an osar, probably unconsciously. Let's face it. Klal Yisrael has been through two millennia of Gehenna. We survived. We survived. We all learned how to survive amazingly well. We are survivors. The Haftarah calls it last week, Ud Mutzel Me'esh. Every Jew I see today is a strand rescued, plucked out of the flames. Plucked out of the flames. Reb Michal Ber Weismandl, who was a survivor, he jumped out of the train on the way to Auschwitz. His wife and children were murdered. He built the yeshiva of Nitra Mount Kisco, and he himself survived. And once that he remarried and at the bris of one of his children, he said that the Gemara says in Zvachim <coughs> that you have the meat of the carbonus that were brought up and designated to be put on the altar to be burnt. But not all of them made it. Some of them slipped away and didn't go up in the flames. They have the same sanctity. So he said, the Nazis wanted everybody in the gas chambers. Some of us slipped away. We're on the same, same level of sanctity. That's what he said. I want to apply it also psychologically. The Jews who survived, my mother, my father, your mother, your father, your Zayda, your Baba, your Elta Zayda, your Elta Baba, they didn't die in the gas chambers, but a piece of them died outside of the gas chambers. And all I can do is have endless compassion and empathy for a people that went through what no other people went through, a jungle that continued for thousands of years and yet was committed to rebuild families, to rebuild communities. One could say a special bracha of Shechiyonu, but with, with tremendous empathy and gratitude, we can also be aware of the loss. We can also be aware of Hitler and Stalin's long hand that still has a tremendous impact on the Jewish psyche. Rip Shimon Russell once told me a number of years ago, he said in Lakewood he started to see Russian patients 
You remember? And he said, I diagnosed them all with Asperger's until I learned about the history of Jews in the Soviet Union. Now, I didn't need him to finish the sentence. My family, both sides, come from the Soviet Union. I grew up in a community filled with Russian Jews. What Stalin did was unbelievable. He pit family members against each other. If you informed on your sister, your brother, your mother, your father, your son, your daughter, you were elevated in the party. You got more bread. You got a better job. You got a house. So the family unit was gone. Nobody trusted anybody. If I asked you if it's day now, you would say it's night. You had to lie to survive. Emotions? You're crazy? You want people to feel emotions? That's akin to putting a bullet in your brain. All emotions had to be shut down. He diagnosed them as Asperger's. It was a great diagnosis. None of them are Asperger's. I mean, there's some Asperger's. <laughs> I must say there's no Asperger's coming out of Russia. But it's much deeper than that. And so, and so, pa your parents come to visit you. They see what you're doing with your children. And like, you need gvura. I'm going to rephrase their words with a lot of empathy. I shut down my emotions 62 years ago. That's exactly what you should be doing. Why are you feeling the pain? And it's exactly what you should tell your children to be doing. It's what my mother did. Wow, I have empathy for that message. They don't say that. The words are as follows. You have to tell her that in this house, we have sneers. Wow. Schwiger, you deserve a Nobel Prize for that Chinuch method. Wow, brilliant. I never thought of it. I never, and you say, Dvairi, in this house, sneers. And Dvairi says, oh, mommy, I didn't realize. Really? Oh, yeah, let me run up to the room and find the clothes that Adam and Chava <laughs> wove for themselves after they ate from the tree of knowledge so that I could put on those clothes and become a source of nachas for Zaidi and Bobby and for mommy and Tati and get the best shidduch in Borough Park, Muncie, Lakewood, and gold is green. You have to tell him that in this house, we have a yarmulke. Wow, Hitaka never knew that. He never knew that everyone in the house wears a yarmulke. You know that. He never knew. He only wore yarmulke himself for like 17 years. He put it on around 10,000 times every morning. In the middle of the night, he would search for it. But what are they really saying? We're desperate. I don't know what to do. I know that my parents screamed at me and they said, this is how it is. And I listened and there was obedience. And why can't we just restore the glory of the Jewish people? Chadesh Yemenu Kekedem, I shut down my emotions. Please shut down your emotions. I am completely unaware of my inner consciousness. Why are you digging up graves? Archaeology is not a Jewish vocation. Let it look good. We don't need shovels. We don't want to see what's happening beneath the earth. We want to see what's happening on the surface. We need pictures. Pictures. I have empathy. I have empathy. It's sometimes hard. You want support from the closest people in your life. But it's a journey. Everyone is on a journey. You have to be able to have a lot of midas harachemim, a lot of compassion and empathy, because people are triggered very, very deeply. I'm triggered. I'm sure some of you are triggered. You expect people who are even less aware and not dealt with this, with this subject for many years not to be triggered. But that ability for you, for us, for all of us, not to lose our conviction. Not to think that this jungle is endless. To believe that our children are essentially sick, chas v'shalom. And essentially, essentially destructive, chas v'shalom. And I have to say something else. You got to believe in yourselves too. Not only in your children. I can't believe in my children if I don't believe in myself. And I'll tell you something else. You can't even believe in God if you don't believe in yourself.
I once saw a line from an African-American woman. She said, God, no, make no junk. Brilliant. God, no, make no junk. It's really a story in the Gemara. It says in Tainus, Tafchaf, Rebbe Lazar, Rebbe Shimon, was coming back from learning, and he saw a man, and the man told him, Shalom Aleichem, and he looked at him, and he seemed so ugly, and he said, you're such an ugly person. And what he meant was, not that he was physically ugly, he meant that he saw a spiritual disease in his face, and he was trying to, you know, shock treatment, he was trying to wake him up. And the man looked at him and said, Leich l'uman sa'ani kama mechur Go to the craftsman who formed me and tell him this vessel that you formed is really grotesque. Go to the craftsman who formed me. Leich le'uman sha'asani. God, no, make no junk. So to believe that Hashem made a mistake when he gave you these children is not just not to believe in your own competence, it's to believe in, not to believe in Hashem's competence. He chose the best parents for the best children. Of course, you are the best father for each one of your children. I promise you. I don't have a doubt. You are the best mother for each one of your children. One day your children will look at you and say, thank you for being the most exceptional father and mother. I know we're not there yet. But you have to believe in yourself. I may have to learn, we have to grow, I have to challenge myself, I have to learn about my own traumas, my own triggers, my own responses, my own ego, my own disappointments. The only way we can respect and have empathy for the pain of our children is if we respect and have empathy for our own pain. I have not yet met the person who can empathize with other people's pain, but with their own pain they shut it down and repress it. It simply does not work. I was once sitting at a Shabbos, t- sh- our Shabbos table and I asked my children, which is the hardest mitzvah of the 613 mitzvahs? I don't know why I asked the question. And one of my boys, a very, very uh, deep soul, very deep soul, says, Avas Yisra, loving the other. I said, why is that so hard? You're such a loving child. And this is what he said. He was like seven years old. He said, because the mitzvah is v'ahavta l'reacha kamoicha. You have to love the other like you love yourself. And to love yourself is hard. You have to love yourself. V'ahavta l'reacha kamoicha. That's hard. How, how on target? How on target? We're a selfless people. By shanam rachmanam gaim l'chasadam. Mothers learned to die for their children. Even while they were alive, they died for their kids. I once saw a mother tell her family, You think it was easy for me to stay married to your father? I did it for you! And this was her way of making her children feel good and grateful. So her daughter tells me afterwards, you get it? She was a martyr. She murdered her soul for us to feel good. Isn't that a great feeling to give your children? No? No? You die so that they can live. Wow, amazing. What an amazing mother I had. And of course, I murdered her. (laughs) That's a great legacy. Wow. The gift of self-awareness. Kamoicha, the Kotzker Rebbe once said, Re'ei Anoichi. Re'ei Anoichi means ze zich. You got to look at Anoichi. I have to look at me. The Baal Shem Tov once said, it says, Why twice? Rebuke shall you rebuke your fellow. And he said, rebuke, but before you rebuke someone else, you first have a conversation with another person. You know who? Yourself. Before I talk to my wife or my husband or my children or anybody else, can I first have a conversation with myself? Before I open my mouth one in the morning, when my daughter comes into the kitchen or your son comes into the kitchen, before you open your mouth, No problem, but just have a conversation with yourself. Feel what is happening. Feel your triggers. Be curious. Be open. Be inquisitive. And have empathy. Because I know that one o'clock in the morning trigger is not an easy one. You haven't slept in 19 and a half hours. And at one in the morning when she strolls into the kitchen, she opens the refrigerator. And she says, there's nothing to eat. Of course, you have stocked up food in your refrigerator 
enough to support three communities for a year. It's a Jewish home, but there's nothing to eat. And every trigger in you wants to say, there's nothing to eat, go to another house. Don't come here one o'clock in the morning. <laughs> you have to have empathy for yourself. It's hard, it's tough. But only with that empathy can you then choose to respond and ask yourself, what can I say now that will bring me closer to this child? What can I say now that will help this child fill the hole, assuage the pain that eats up at their neshama 24-7? That faith in ourselves, that faith in our children, that conviction, you can do it, I can do it, we can do it is something we need to sustain every single day. No, you're not punished, you're not valueless, you're not bad parents, you're not inconsequential, you were empowered and given a mission to be here for exceptional souls in ways that nobody else in the world can be here. But these children needed something else too. Those children in the jungle, they knew the terrain. They knew the forest. If they wouldn't have known the forest, they could have never survived. To survive this jungle, you got to know the forest. You got to know what works. You got to know what doesn't work. Well, many of you know this forest well. Those of you who don't know it, welcome to Keshenafshi. You're going to find that a lot over this Shabbos. You know what works. You know what doesn't work. You know which plants are poisonous. You know which plants are delicious. When people give you the advice to scream, to chastise, to rebuke, to alienate, to expel, the question is, how well did that work for your children? When you scream about respect for Shabbos, respect for Kashtras, respect for Pesach, respect for Tati, respect for Zaidi, respect for Torah, respect for Mitzvahs, and you go to your room and you feel like a hero, such Yerusha Mayim just came out of my mouth. Wow. It's like I'm getting an aid just for this. And for two weeks, your son didn't come out of the room. How well did that work? How frum did they become? Does anybody know one child who was thrown out of the house, who was alienated from parents, and the child started to cry and said, Oh, yeah, I have to do tshuva. I'm not waiting for you, Kipper. I'm coming right back. Get me woolen tzitzis. I'm standing up for me five in the morning. Is there a minion before so I could wake up earlier? I want to say something else. I don't know anybody who came to Kesher Nafshi. Almost anybody. Without first experimenting. <laughs> with a lot of other methods. Nobody watches their child, so to speak, slip away from Yiddishkeit and say, Yeah, I know exactly. Avi Fishov. We're running to Avi. Most people are schlepped to these places in shackles. There's a friend who calls you and says, you want your daughter to start cutting herself? That's what brought you here. Nobody came voluntarily. Everybody came with the evidence. You tried everything else. You know what works in the jungle and what doesn't work in the jungle. Don't doubt that. <laughs> you have experimented. You know what happens when your daughter does not have to turn her parents into the enemy. You know what happens when your son does not have to turn you into the son of Yisrael, when you stop being the Hitler of his life, when you stop being the evil of his life. Suddenly he has a support system. Suddenly he can start healing from disconnect. Suddenly, or maybe after some time, he can become inquisitive and say, if my parents are such good people, why am I so miserable? Wow. And a journey of discovery can begin. But of course, if I'm alien from my child, I remain the eternal enemy. He never even has to look at himself. He has the most weirded out, crazy, insane, narcissistic, mishugana, despotic, self-centered, and addicted parents. You know what works. We got to know this jungle. And let me say something else. Everyone needs advice. Great. But 
advice from people who have experience. I got a letter a few weeks ago from a very, very, very prominent leader of a yeshiva with a very long Misha Beirach, once again. And the accusation was that I'm almost single-handedly destroying Klal Yisrael with clips and videos and essays and, and shiurim and classes taking away the Jewish people from their Messiah. Now, I'm not going to tell you I have the thickest skin in the world. I don't. I'm a sensitive person. But I don't get shaken up from every email because then I would be in a psych ward. But some shake me up because when somebody throws and hurls an accusation like that, it's like, and I, I sat down, I stopped, and I asked myself, maybe he's right. So what did I do? I forwarded the email to Rip Shimon Russell. Let him deal with it. What do I got to deal with it? Let him deal with it. You pass on the trauma to the next person. That's the way it goes. <laughs> Somebody once asked me, what's Pshara Noval? Let's see it. Mekablin Dain Mindain Vamran Kaddish. Anybody knows what that means? It's one of those things you say. I said it's talking about a loan. I borrow money from you. Now I have to pay back. I don't have. So I take money from the ankle. Right? And I pay you back. Now I have to pay back the ankle. So I go to Shmerl. I take money, I pay back Yankel, I have to pay back Shmuel, I go to Zundel. Mekablin Dain Mindain, Vamrin Kaddish. Somebody is going to say Kaddish on the money. I don't know who. I don't know. I just got to do my job and pay back my debts. And I wrote to Rabbi Shimon, Rabbi Shimon Russell, I wrote a little line on top. Am I crazy? Is he crazy? <laughs> Maybe you're crazy. We'll figure that out soon. <laughs> Who's the crazy one in the crowd, right? You got to know. Sometimes you need that litmus. I asked myself, listen, maybe I'm, you know, sometimes you convince yourself stuff and you start believing your own Meshagasa. So I thought, maybe the guy is right. Maybe I've been at too many Kesher Nafshi events. <laughs> maybe I've listened to too many stories from certain individuals. Maybe I got to go into another environment, hear different stories Hear about all the success stories when we throw the kids out and we tell them that they're losers and their disappointments to the family. Maybe, I don't know, maybe there's a whole other demographic I don't know about. So that's what I did. I said I, I needed the support. So Rabbi Shimon wrote back to me and he said, why don't, he actually called me. He didn't, did he ask you permission first? He called me between one plane and another plane, don't worry. <laughs> and he said, why don't you find out from this great man how much research did he do into this sugya? Did I say it right? Or to this parsha? Women have parsha, the men have sugya. How much research, how much data did he read? How many teenagers that are struggling did he meet with? Maybe one, maybe five, maybe 50, maybe 200. Did he listen to their stories? Did he ask them about their experiences? Was he attentive? And then just find out. Maybe he, maybe he interviewed 10,000 teenagers and he has data and he interviewed therapists and principals and teachers and parents. Maybe. Just find out. It was a great answer. So I wrote up an email. <laughs> You're going to be disappointed with the answer. But apparently the person didn't even know one. He didn't even know one. He certainly didn't have a child like that. So I say you may be dealing with people who have the best intentions. But if somebody was never in a jungle, don't get instructions from them how to navigate it. Not because they're not good people. They may be wonderful and amazing people. But you have to know. You have to know. Once I heard a speech from the Shimon and I asked him afterwards, how do you know all this? Maybe it's a lie. Maybe it's not true. Maybe it's your own bias, negias. 
He said, you're right. But I spoke to many teenagers for 35 years. I said, how many? He said, 10,000. I said, okay. If somebody spoke to 10,000 teenagers who all went through this experience, there's some data. You want to talk, you want to listen, you want to read. Parents, teachers, mentors, therapists, Rosh Yeshivas, Rebbes, Mashgicha, Mashpia, Mechanicha, instructors, pedagogues who have experience. <laughs> Who know, who know what this is about. Somebody who makes fun of the word trauma. There are people who make fun of the word. I'm sure you hear it. Oh, Rabbi Waiwei, another trauma class? Now, I understand there's a good sense of humor. I get it. But somebody who just makes fun of this concept. Obviously, they don't know what it is for a girl or for a boy to have been raped at five years old for three years. They don't know. So they're going to tell me they're going to tell you how to treat your 18-year-old boy or girl who has been raped or molested for three years. Their soul was stolen. Their body was murdered. They disassociated from their emotions. They became emotionally crippled. In the deepest core, they feel that they are worthless and valueless. They want to die rather than live. For them, Judaism is the source of anguish and pain because it happened by somebody who was a from Jew, and he probably said a Pusik while he did it. Can you understand that when this kid took off his yarmulke, and I'm going to try to say this without crying, he may be the tzaddik, hador, for taking off this yarmulke. You know why? Because for him, the yarmulke equals raping the soul of another Jew because the person had a yarmulke. And when he's taking over this yarmulke, he's saying, I will not be part of a God who allows rape. Do you realize that for him taking over the yarmulke, it's his statement that he's committed to truth, L-A-K-M-S. He won't worship Avodah He won't be part of a system that can see injustice in its midst, midst and say nothing. He won't be over on Samad al dam Reyecha and shvich is damim, and be quiet? Can nobody realize that this is a revolt against toxicity and poison that has infiltrated the Jewish community in a very deep way, and that those who speak are condemned, and that perpetrators have become victims, and victims have become perpetrators because they speak up? Can't we realize that these children are unconsciously or consciously protesting like Elio Anavi in his day against Achav and his wife Izevel, who murdered Nevois and then stole his vineyard, and Elio said, Haratzachta, the Gabyarashta. You murder Nevois the Israeli, and then you inherit his field. I, we, this child got murdered, and now the Gabyarashta. And now we condemn him for embarrassing his family. I love it. <laughs> a child was murdered emotionally and now he or she is condemned for protesting it. They are condemned for doing things that for them is the only way they know how to survive under these unbearable conditions. Because I, the father or the mother, unfortunately was stupid or apathetic or indifferent or Things happen beyond my control, never mind if the parents sometimes may have been even involved, consciously or unconsciously. So who am I going to ask about this? Somebody who doesn't understand this? Somebody who's not sensitive to this? Somebody who thinks that this child is from, from the Gestapo? Really? That's who I should consult? Somebody who doesn't feel the soul of these kids? And you know what? I like artificial intelligence, but don't go to artificial intelligence for this. And I hate to say this, but some of our great minds are like artificial intelligence. That's what trauma looks like. You know what trauma looks like? Artificial intelligence. Only one difference. Artificial intelligence, I don't expect more. Human beings were supposed to feel. If I'm not mistaking God, build us a mitzvah via hafta, I want you to feel. I don't want artificial intelligence. When we navigate Chinuch through artificial intelligence, we perpetuate this trauma. 
I know what it is. I told you I come from families of Russian Jews where they suffered from emotional constipation. You weren't a lot of fear. You survived by disassociating from emotion. I got it. And you were a good Jew. You were a good Jew. So we take our brilliant brains, we become computers, and we try to control the situation. But that's not what children need, and that's not what adults need. You know what we need? We need attachment, dveikos, hiskashros, v'nafshay kshura b'nafshay, loy toiv heyoysa adam levadoy, we can't be alone. We need to know the terrain of the jungle and how to heal it. And don't doubt yourself every day, 24-7, when you're making those somersaults emotionally or physically. And you're choosing attachment over detachment, closeness over distance, connection over separation, love over alienation. Don't doubt yourself and give yourself a standing ovation in that kitchen, 1.30 in the morning. Look into the mirror of the cabinet, it's for the women, and give yourself a standing ovation. Yes, I was triggered, and I chose attachment over alienation. This daughter is going to go back to her room and feel like she has a mother. She has a father. Don't underestimate that because that's what spells the difference between death and life. Between cutting myself and overdosing versus coming back down to the house and enjoying dinner with my brothers and sisters. Don't underestimate that. That's a victory. Victory in this case doesn't mean what everybody thinks is a victory. Victory happens every moment and every hour. And the only one who really knows it is Hashem and you and your child, nobody else. And that's enough. That's enough. Victory does not mean that it's on the websites. It's on the front page of magazines. Victory is about that internal awareness that you just chose. The path of connection, the path of love, the path of real dedication to the Rebbeinu Shalaylam and your children. You chose what your soul told you to do because your soul has no ego. You responded not from your ego, but from your soul, which is a chelik elekami mal. That deserves a standing ovation. There's one more thing about this jungle that we have to know. And that is in a jungle, there's a lot of overgrown plants and bushes, and it's very hard to see. It's very hard to see. That's why they couldn't find these kids. I saw some time ago a teaching from the Maggid of Mizrich. The Maggid of Mizrich was the successor of the Baal Shem Tev. He says something, you know, sometimes you read something and your breath is taken away for a few moments. And I thought, how many books of psychology are compressed in these four lines? And this is what he says. Everybody knows the story. Yosef was sold as a slave, first thrown into a pit, sold as a slave. The wife of Potiphar, who must have been beautiful, took a liking to him. The Torah says Yosef was handsome, beautiful. Yefei Toya, Yefei Mara. Every day she nudges this poor 17-year-old boy. Come, be with me, be with me, be with me. And then one day nobody is home. He comes home to do his work and nobody is there. There's an argument between Rav and Shmuel and the Gemara says in Saito Lamed Vav and Rashi quotes it according to one opinion. Yosef surrendered. He came home to do his work. It means to be together with her. He couldn't, he couldn't abstain any longer. There was nobody home. And in the last moment, what happens, says the Gemara and the Medrash and the Zohar, he saw the image of Yaakov, his father. He abstained, he fled, he left the house. We all know the continuation of the story. She accused him, he ends up in prison, becomes the prime minister of Egypt. The rest, as they say, is history. Everybody wants to know, where did Yaakov's image come from? Where was it? Where was it till now? What happened now? How did it emerge now? And how did it stop Yosef? He knew what his father looked like also before this event. There's many interpretations. The Helik Magad of Mezrich Chusayag and Aleinu Rabbeinu Doivber, this is what he says. Wow. This is what he says. He says, you know where he saw Yaakov's image? He saw it in Poitifar's wife. As he looked at Poitifar's wife and he watched his own craving, 
He watched his own arousal. He observed his own passion, his own yearning and pining for this relationship. Suddenly, he saw the image of Yaakov, his father, and this is what he says. Svasayim Yeshak. What was so appealing about Petifer's wife? The answer is her beauty. Yosef was Yefei Toya V'Yefei Mara. Petifer's wife was Yefei Toya V'Yefei Mara. It was beauty. It says in Zoyar that the Midah of Yaakov is Midas Hatiferes. The Midah of Yaakov is the Midah of beauty, of harmony, of rachim, of compassion, of empathy. Yosef was such a worked out person at 17. When he looked at Petifer's wife, he can ask himself, what am I looking for in this relationship? What do I really want in this relationship? I know my system is telling me I want Petifer's wife, but what am I really searching for? She's a married woman. I'm not allowed to be with her. What do I really want? What do I really want? And suddenly, you know what he saw? He's looking for Tiferes. He's looking for that connection with inner beauty, with inner harmony, with his own Tiferes. And then he says to himself, my father is the source of Tiferes. My father is the divine manifestation of God's Midah of Tiferes. So why should I settle for the outer camouflaged representation of Tiferes, which is not even going to sustain me, because it's not what I'm looking for, when I can actually connect to the core of Tiferes. So to put it in different words psychologically, you know what Yaakov realized at that moment? I'm not looking to take a married woman. I'm looking for a father. I'm looking for a father. He saw it in Petifer's wife. It's not like Yaakov showed up suddenly on a screen. CNN was playing in Petifer's wife and Yaakov was videoed. As he was watching his craving, he could see beneath the surface. He could see beneath the jungle. He could say, it's not this married woman I'm looking for. I'm looking for a father. I need attachment. I never had a day of attachment in my life. I need to supplement my attachment. Isn't that true about so many lives? If at age five my heart was shattered into 2,000 pieces, if at age five I felt no safety, no security, no not being seen, not being soothed in the four holy S's of Rabbi Shimon Russell with two S's, two out of the four, two S's, two S's, okay, add four, but you and your husband, it's four. <laughs> I was thinking Gedalia Miller, no S, maybe his wife, Avi Fish of one S. Okay, we're doing well. And Shabbos is Shabbos with an S, because Shabbos is all about the four S's. Shabbos, that's what Shabbos is. What was Shabbos created for? Huh? God created Shabbos thousands of years ago. They didn't need it so much. Today, with the phones, that's what he created Shabbos for. <laughs> there could be 24 hours. I could feel safe and secure and seen and soothed because you're not looking at your phone, for heaven's sake. I went, I was in Florida, so I was with my wife. We went to a restaurant to eat. So near as there was a family, I promise you, a husband and a wife, a son and a daughter, everybody was on their phone at a restaurant that they went out to to connect with. How in the world did I get into the four S's? Oh. This five-year-old, I'm with you, this five-year-old didn't have that. So if I didn't get love as a child, what do I look for for the rest of my life? I look for validation. I need you and you and you and you and you to tell me after my speech, Rabbi Why Why, you changed my life. Uh, that, that was just a little therapy, it's fine. It's fine. Don't do applause for rabbis because they think you want more. It's just a clown. We look for validation. The brilliance of Yosef at that moment to know what he was looking for. I'm not looking for Petifa's wife. I'm not looking for that piece of chocolate. I don't want to binge. I'm not looking for the alcohol. I'm not looking for the porn. I'm not looking for the cocaine. I'm looking for a father. Wow. And he got his father. He connected to his father because his father was connected to him. His father never stopped crying for him, never stopped believing that he's alive. He connected to Midas HaTiferes. He filled his hole. He didn't need Petifer's wife. He knew what a jungle looks like. Can we 
train ourselves to see that way. Al Tabet al you don't look at the chitzonius of addiction. Don't look at the chitzonius of chaotic behavior. Don't look at the rebelliousness from an external perspective. The Muz the Yoikno Shal Yaakov, look at what your child really is yearning for, because then I can give that. And with myself too and yourself too. When you're getting triggered, when you're getting angry, when you're getting upset, may I say, don't look only at what you're feeling. Look at what you're really feeling. Look at what you're really looking for. What is your parent, your child, in blunt terms, becoming secular? What is it doing to you? Be honest. Be very honest. Because the day you and I become honest about that, we can actually help them instead of running away to numb our pain and camouflage it as being from. The day that people can be very on, what is really bothering me? And you may find out some things you don't like to say to yourself. If what's really bothering you is that your child is not fulfilling the will of God, there's no ego, there's no social conformity, There's no fear of other people. There's no disappointment that I'm a failure. Look what a bad father and mother I am. You're really pained by your child's pain? Ah, you're right on the path to redeeming your child. You're right on the path to helping them. But as long as I blame it on other things, I'm dishonest with myself. I'll be dishonest with my child and they'll feel it. Finally, there's the, four, the third component that these kids had. What did they have? They had each other. Nobody can live in a jungle alone. That person has not been created yet. I'll, let's face it, nobody can live outside of a jungle alone. That hasn't, person hasn't been created yet. Everyone needs support. You're going to hear a whole Shabbos about how to be there for your kids. Before Shabbos, I'm going to say something else. You want to be there for your kids? Great. You have to be here for yourself. If you will not be here for yourself, you will not be able to be here for your kids. I don't want to sound cliche. Parents in these situations have to eat well. Like me. You could do a little better. Like my wife, okay? Half, 50% I got right. Okay, nishka ferlich. For a man, 50% nishkafelech. You got to exercise. You have to sleep. You have to have people who believe in you, support you, people you can speak to, people you can connect to. If you have a therapist who's busy judging you, change. You don't owe him anything. Change the therapist. If you have people giving you advice that is toxic, there's a magical word without lying. I got to go now. Have a beautiful day. I got to go. I know, but I got to go. Bye. I love you. I love you. Bye. Boom. Baruch shepatrani me'oynesh halazeh. With shame and malchus, maybe. That you'll ask your of. <laughs> Nothing wrong. I got to go now. You don't have to lie. Don't lie. I just got to go. You got to go. You know why? Because that person won't save your child, you will. So go take a nap. Go take a walk. Go journal, go swimming, go massage, do yoga, do Pilates, go to the gym, get an iced coffee, listen to a YY clip. <laughs> Whatever. Thank you. Whatever you got to do for, self, for self-nurture. And one more thing. This is a hard one. I have found people that their children's situation destroy their marriages. It's very hard to help our children if the couple does not work out their own stuff. It's very difficult. In fact, I would say, the Gemara says in Saita Daf Yud Zayin, when a husband and a wife really are at peace, the Shekhinah is there. Wherever the Shekhinah is, there's healing. When the divine presence comes into your home, your children will heal. The only way the divine presence can come into our homes is when we and our spouses work out our issues. I would say even more, sometimes our children's journeys are there 
to help educate us, enlighten us, elevate us. Many of our marriages have been superficial. It works. You get married, and there's a mission statement. It's very clear. You hatch, you match, and you dispatch. That's the mission statement in the from world. In the middle of Achnach, the Bris, Abba Mitzvah, Upshenrich, Bas Mitzvah, Shidduch, Yeshiva, High School, Shas, Bavli. Next! Convey a belt. Huh? You like it, yeah? You like it, yeah? Remember that. Remember that. You know what? Very many of us didn't live with awareness, didn't live with depth. We survived. But this is the era of Geula. And in the era of Geula, you don't just have a superficial relationship. You have a deep and intimate and authentic relationship. Hashem tells Klai so I want to connect to you through and through and through and through. I want your heart. I want your passion. I want to come into your home and see the expanse of consciousness. I want the love. I want the romance. So who's going to change Klai Yisrael? So our children's souls, listen to this, voluntarily in heaven, volunteered for a mission like no other. And you know why I say a mission like no other? Because they're being accused of destroying their families. And really what they're doing is they're helping enlighten us, elevate us, inspire us, and bring us to places we would have never achieved. And that's why we ought to say to them from the depth of our heart, thank you for your mysterious nefesh. Thank you for your mysterious nefesh. Thank you very much. Hafrelech and Shabbos. This class is brought to you by the yeshiva.net. Please help us continue the classes. Make even a small contribution at www.theyeshiva.net slash donate.